We are in Luke chapter 4 this morning, if you have your Bibles uh, with you, and we're going to be looking at a, a, an exciting passage of Scripture um, where this is the, the headline battle, if you will. This is Jesus and, and Satan, the devil, going at it. And so it's a great passage of Scripture um, where we find that Jesus is tempted, and so the uh, title of the sermon this morning is Temptation 101. Um, and so I want to just start with this little story about a guy uh, from Douglas Aircraft. And, and years ago, Douglas Aircraft, they merged with Boeing, I think, in the 90s. Um, but in the 80s, he was competing against Boeing to build aircraft for these companies. One of those companies was called Eastern Airlines. Eastern Airlines, they had one contract they were going to give, and it was between Boeing and and Douglas Aircraft, and this guy, that's Donald Douglas there, not Donald the Duck, uh, Donald Douglas. And so the, the guy from Eastern Airlines calls Donald, and he says, hey, listen, you all are specking out at the same as, as Boeing, but they're beating you in one thing, the noise reduction of the cabin. They are quieter than you. Can you beat it? And so he goes to his engineers, and he finds out they can't. And he knows that the contract is on the line, and he, so he goes back to Eastern Airlines. He says, listen, I've talked to all my engineers, um, but that I, we can't beat it. The guy from Eastern Airlines says, I know you can't. I just wanted to see if you would continue to be honest. Like He knew the numbers. He knew, the, he knew all the things. And he put this Donald, the CEO of his company, on the line to see if he would submit and fall in to temptation. It was very tempting. It would have been easy to overpromise, right? And be like, oh yeah, we can do it, we can do it, we can do it, and then deal with the repercussions later. You see, he, he dealt with something that each and, of, each and every one of us deal with every day of life. Every Christian deals with temptation. In one form or another, the truth is, it's part of our everyday Christian life. And guess who was not exempt from that? Christ himself. Christ himself. Jesus was tempted, and you will be tempted, and you will always be tempted. And so our character and our ability for God to use us really depends pretty heavily on how we resist and how we deal with temptation in our life, we see it in all kinds of different ways. Um, I mean, I could just, we, we could go around the room and say, how are you tempted? And all of you would lie. So that's one temptation is lying. Um, but hey, it's tax time right now, right? Like you start doing your taxes and they're like, how much did you give to Goodwill? Or you get the little piece of paper from Goodwill and they say, how much is these clothes worth? You know, that's all Polo and Ralph Lauren. That's worth about probably $500 what I paid for it, you know? It's really easy. You're tempted to change those numbers or tax time. Maybe you got paid cash on the side for some things. And it's like, well, Uncle Sam doesn't know about that. Well, he doesn't know it won't hurt him, right? And so just tempted even in these little, small things in life because just a, a little bigger refund check, just maybe. Or maybe we're tempted to, to, watch, to watch videos or go to websites or go to places that we know we shouldn't go, that we know that are just there waiting for us, and we have to scroll past, or we have to choose not to, we have to decide not to do that. Whatever the things are in your life, I promise you, every look at your neighbor, they're tempted. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall, because the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. That's a comforting thing for me to know that what I'm dealing with, it's not that much different than what you're dealing with. Your neighbor is dealing with the same as you are dealing with it. So we're going to look today at this story about Jesus and the, the enemy, and we're, we're going to call this Temptation uh, 101. It's interesting for me because it's kind of a familiar story um, because the tempter here is Satan, is the devil, uh, you know, one time the devil went down to Eden, the Garden of Eden, all right? And he began to tempt the first man. He tempted Adam and Eve. And they succumbed to it, right? They, they gave in. 
They gave in to the temptation. And they were in this perfect setting. And so here we, years and years later, generations later, the same enemy, the same Satan, has the opportunity to come to the Son of Man, Jesus, and tempt him. Because he knows if he can get Jesus to give in to the temptation, God's entire plan of salvation for humanity is done. I mean, this is big strategy. This is like the winner takes all for the devil. <laughs> if I can get him, I've disrupted God's whole thing. Are you thankful that the enemy cannot disrupt God's whole plan? That the devil went down the Garden of Eden and won, and he went to Judea here in this story and lost? Spoiler alert. Jesus doesn't give in. Let's read the passage. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the, the reminder, he's just been baptized. God is, the Holy Spirit came down on him, and God looked down and said, This is my son, whom I am well pleased. Then we come to chapter 4. It says, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Many sermon, the Spirit does not always lead you into comfort or the Mar Marriott. Okay? Jesus, following the Spirit, takes him into the desert to not eat for 40 days. Where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days, Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it to you if you will worship me. And Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. This morning, I want to just talk to you really about three things. If we broke the temptation one-on-one -on -one into three sections, we're going to talk about the source of the temptation here, the tempter himself. We're going to talk a little bit about the strategies he used. And then we're going to reveal the secret weapon. All right, y'all want a secret weapon against temptation in your life? So we're going to look at these, these three things. First, let's just talk a little bit about the, the old devil, pesky guy. Um, we could spend a long time talking about him. I think it's important to see from the scripture we can, we can see a, a, a few things about him. One, he is not omnipresent like God is. You think of God and you know that he is everywhere in all things, at all places, at all times. Can hear every prayer from every believer at the same time. He is all present, not just physically, but across all time. He sees from now to forever. He is present. He's everywhere. The enemy, the devil, is not. He is in one place at one time. He, how could he leave Jesus if he's not, not contained to that reality of his life? So the, the reality that you might face Satan himself in your own struggles, you know, unless you, you're, a, you, you, you know, you're a significant challenge against God's mission, you could at times, but he usually sends his demons and his work throughout the spiritual realm to be attacking you and working against you in your life. But the schemes are his. He is the captain, all right? But he is not omnipresent. There's all kinds of scripture talk about him as the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air. It says, hey, before you were saved, you were doing what his bidding. You were in his kingdom. He was your master. Even if you, if you didn't call yourself a devil worshiper, you were in his kingdom. But you're not anymore. He has this ultimate goal uh, to, to disrupt all the things, uh, sets himself against God and God's uh, uh, people. All the things that God wants to do and work through his people, the enemy is against. 
okay? In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul said it like this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stake, take a stand against the devil's schemes. What he's saying is the battle you feel in your life for good and evil and prosperity and backing up is real. And you have a real enemy. If you have decided in your life that all of that stuff's a hogwash, then the enemy has won. There is a real battle. The struggle is real. The things that God has for you in your life and wants you to do and wants to work through you and the spiritual gifts that he's given you and the loss he wants to reach and the change he wants to bring into a community, the devil is totally against. He's against you being here this morning. He's against new beginnings ever gathering believers together. He's against every church in this town that's gathering believers together. He's against lost people being saved in Pikeville. He's against drug addicts and, and people who are homeless finding the needs that they, they meeting the needs from the church and seeing that, man, Jesus really loves me. He's against all that and is working continually to bring it to a halt and disrupt it. There's scripture. Uh, that tells us, here we find he wants you to worship him. He wanted Jesus to worship him. Scripture that tells us he wants to devour us. Here's why this is important. And then we'll move on to more fun things than talking about the devil. It, it's important because sin leads to death. That's where he's always tempting you into. He's tempting you to sin, to go against God's will for your life and his commandments and his guidance. Well, we know that, that as humans, and the gospel teaches us that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That sin condition is what separates us from God and makes, gives us our need for Jesus to put our faith and trust in him, and he can save us. Absent Jesus, we are dead, eternally separated from God, all right? So, yes, sin brings death, spiritual death, if we don't have Jesus in our heart. But, but here's what I want to share with you. Even as a believer protected by Jesus Christ, you're going to mis have mistakes and missteps and sin in your life. And the enemy wants more of that because that sin too brings death. It brings death to peace in your life. If he can tempt you into sin, it can also bring death to your marriage. Are you following me for a minute? You think the enemy doesn't want to destroy believers' marriage? It can destroy your career. Death to a career. It can cause the death of a family unit. If he can get people in the family pursuing themselves and distracted away from God's call and purpose and direction in life, it can destroy the family Unit. It can call the death of your witness and your Christian, Christian testimony, your ability to lead in the church or lead in any other way for him, all because we had some moral failure that the devil tempted us into. And so just for a minute, I want you to realize that, that, that the, the, the rules, the guidance, the commandments of God were written because guess what? He created this place. He knows how it would work best. He created earth. And he set these commandments and guidance in, in place so that it would be a healthier, happier place. And we just rebel against it, right? We know that, that if we are faithful to our spouse, life is more peaceful and there's less chaos. We know if we don't lie, if we don't cheat, life is better. We know if I could just be happy with my truck and not want my neighbor's truck, I'd feel better at night, all right? Like, so God designed all these things, and the enemy wants to disrupt all that and get as much sin in your life and your family and all around us and rebellion against all that as he can because he can't take your salvation, but he can disrupt your life. That's the guy you're up against and what he's trying to do and what he wants. Next, we see the strategies he uses. That's the source Here's the strategies, and we're just going to kind of walk through these. I think it's important to rem remember from James before we go back to this passage in Luke. James said it like this in chapter 1, verse 13. It says, And remember when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires. 
Temptation comes from our own desires. Your own desires in your own heart. It says they entice us and drag us away. They entice us and drag us away. Verse 15 says these desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. We talked a lot about death, sin, the devil. This is good. Y'all like shit. We're hashtagging this and sharing it. Um, Y'all here? All right. Let's look at this. Luke chapter 4, verses 3. It says, Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. We're going to look at kind of three ways and strategies the devil uses here as, as his way to tempt us. One is he, he, he leans into our natural cravings. He leans into our natural cravings. He finds Jesus when he's hungry, which is a fully legitimate thing to be if you haven't eaten in 40 days. That's fair enough. Yeah, you're hungry, but, but he begins to try to, to, to disrupt this legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. Are you with me? Sometimes we're temp- what we're tempted to do isn't wrong in and of itself, but it's the motivation that we do it with or the, the obsession that we have with it that has idolized it and created it something that's not what God intended it to be. Here he uses food, a natural craving. Let me tell you something. Jared in the wilderness, 40 days, that stone would have been a roll from Texas Roadhouse. Can I just be honest? <laughs> and food's something we all struggle with. Like we want to pretend like all these other sins are worse, but we all struggle with food in one way or the other. I find lots of peace and comfort in food. If I get stressed out, that's the place I want to go. Man, I just know this week would be better if I could be at El Poncho's one more time. <laughs> just one more. Cheese dip. What is that? <laughs> but this, uh, this, this idea that food or this thing, it tempts us. It distracts us from the true security and the hope that we have in our life. And we can get, you can be the other way about food. You can be a, have an aversion to it and think, all food is going to make me bigger or unhealthy or it's going to be, it, it, it's going to be, and so you become the, the other side of it. You don't eat and you have a disorder that you just can't deal with food. And so the, the enemy wants to disrupt something very natural that God created. Just eat food to live. It's the fuel you have. And we make it, I just got to have it and I got to have this kind at this time, three times a day. And if I don't have it, then my life's just like, it's a mess. And so he disrupts these natural cravings. I think about money, right? Things that are just very natural in life. You've got to have money unless we're bartering, you know, and you're trading, but you've got to have money to do life. Yet it becomes this, the, the temptation becomes to become obsessed with it. And to think if we only had more, I would find more peace. Or, or to think when we do have more and we have all that we need, then we find our security in it. I was thinking the other day, I was talking to a group of people who are associated with a church and help lead a church that just has, in my world, unlimited resources. And I began to think about in that situation, I asked them, I said, what do you pray for when there's nothing you can't pay for? Like, how do you find yourself still dependent upon God? Jesus said, his, told his followers, you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. You're going to be tempted. The, 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 the devil may not get, be, get you to worship him, but he can get you to worship a $100 bill or a promotion or the hope of more or a 401k or an IRA or security through wealth. And materials, and we don't even realize it. Good things, nothing against having those things, nothing against making a career and being successful and having money. As long as we understand and remember where it came from, who gave it to us, give him the glory, share it the way he's taught us to do it. But it's a temptation. It's a temptation. I went and read the seven deadly sins just to be reminded, and you're like, man, this is really going south quick. 
Um, one of them is sloth. I thought, how true is that, that we are tempted in our laziness? I love this definition. It has sloth as an excessive laziness or the failure to act and utilize one's talents. The enemy will get you to believe you don't have a talent. He'll get you to believe he's not gifted you. And you'll be tempted to use it for anything but him. You'll be tempted to not use it at all because you don't even believe you have it. And all of a sudden, what God has created to be good, you are not living into it. And that you're tempted by that. And that's a sin. Like he's working in all these different ways. I thought about sex. A very natural craving. God created it to be between man and wife. And it was, it was full of pleasure and joy and a beautiful thing that he created and the culture has perverted it and turned it into something totally different and idolized it in and of itself and the culture wants you to be consumed with it they sell it they want you to worship it they want you to to, it to be a part of what drives your motivations and actions and who you are and it comes in in so many ways i'm thinking of that james verse that tells us the temptation comes from our own desires that entice us and drag us away it can come into your your own just your thoughts you know we can clean up and come to church you can walk around this place and just have your thoughts full of lustful desires and just let them run loose because yeah, that's in my head but the scripture says those things entice us, draw us away, and they give birth to sinful actions. I think about so in our thoughts, but I also think about this right here. All right? The access the enemy has given to pornography anywhere and everywhere. Talk to people who struggle with it. And they say, I'm sitting in, the, in a parking lot alone. I'm not even thinking about it. All of a sudden, nobody's around and on their phone. I had a friend who, who led a seminary uh, of men, and he said, our number one problem, people not graduating, were people, the students in seminary, getting on pornography on the seminary computers. Like if we think our next generation and what they're coming up against and the ease of access to technology, in itself a good thing, helpful, saving lives, beneficial, always the risk. The reality of what the enemy wants to use and distract us through very natural cravings into something very corrupt and deadly. And then it moves into, you know, physically acting out, adulterous relationships, multiple relationships, sex before marriage, all these things the culture telling us. It's all good. It's like 1960s, free love for everybody and anybody and whatever. And the enemy celebrating, disrupting God's plan. Second thing he does, he says, Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them. The devil said, Because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you worship me. Jesus replied, The scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Here the devil comes to Jesus and he's, he's offering him power. I love this little section because as I was thinking about it, Jesus has come to set up God's kingdom. Everything the enemy is offering him here, Jesus is eventually going to get through God's plan. If he's patient. He's also got death on a cross in that plan. But here the enemy says, and he'll do this to you, he said, here's a shortcut. Here's a shortcut. You won't have to go through all that hard time. You won't have to follow God and, and be made fun of. Here's a shortcut to real friends. You know, just go, come to this party. And he's telling Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross, man. I'm, I'm, I'm the devil, and God's give, kind of giving me authority in this season right here. And Jesus is like, you don't know what's coming to you in a while. Just a short while, I'm going to conquer death, but I'm not going to say that to you right now. 
But the devil's saying, you don't have to go to the cross, just worship me and I'll give you this. I'll give you power and authority, all these kingdoms. I'll give it to you. Just take this shortcut. Then he takes him to the temple in Jerusalem. And he sets him at the highest point and he tells him to jump off and, and, and he quotes scripture. I mean, the devil's using scripture and Jesus using scripture here. Continually, the devil says, jump off. Hey, he said, the Old Testament said that the angels will protect the Messiah. You're going to be safe. You're going to be safe. You, you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded and says, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. So he, the, the enemies use natural cravings. He's trying to get him to take a shortcut to power and to get the things that he, he wants and desires. And then this, this last one, um, let me say it like this. There's a word called volition. V-O-L-I-T-I-O-N. It means this, it's the faculty or power of using one's will. It is this lie that your life is what you make of it. And you, you earned this. You are entitled by this. Jesus, you're God's son. All the angels are going to protect you. How about you do what you want and not what the Father wants? How about you invoke your will and your this? This self-determination to determine my own life and my own outcomes. And he invites him into that. And again, Jesus says, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. The enemy is mad. It's a decisive defeat. It's not final. But he runs. He leaves. says, until the next opportunity comes, I want to share with you the secret weapon. There's sometimes, uh, our little boy, he's five, he loves Legos. Y'all like Legos? Who likes to step on a Lego? <laughs> Nobody. It's the worst. Um, but sometimes you get a Lego, especially when the kids are just first learning. It, you get a, a Lego, and you get a little sideways. Y'all ever been there, and you're trying to get it on? Uh, I always heard my dad use this word, cattywampus. Anybody ever heard that? Maybe he made that up. It's sideways, right? And, and no matter, like, how hard you push on it, they won't go together. You been there? You take a hammer to it, and they won't go together. If you're ever working on a little project, and you get somewhere... And something's, your wrench gets stuck, or, 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 or you're carrying a backpack, and you're trying to get out of somewhere, and it gets caught on the arm of a door, and you're like, what just ha I'm just carrying a backpack. How could that one thing catch this? And you're just pulling as hard as you can, and really all you had to do was just stop and move the one thing. Are you with me for a minute? The Lego, all you have to do is pick it up, and it just falls in place right when you have it straight. This is the same this is the truth about temptation. You do not need another New Year's resolution. You will be tempted to see the thing that is weak in your life that the enemy tempts you with and say, no more, I'm not doing that anymore. You've used your self-will and you've decided... No money, I'm not going to be tempted by you anymore. No alcohol, you're not going to control my life anymore. No pornography, I'm never going to another site again. I've decided. And yet we find the secret back in verse 1. You skimmed right over it. That made all the difference for Jesus. Because Jesus did not do this of his own power. It says, then Jesus, full. Are you ready for the secret weapon? Jesus was full to the brim of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was not controlling his own life. The Holy Spirit was under control. The secret to overcoming temptation. Is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, it says it like this, and we're going to wrap up. 
It says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is important because I want you to understand the Holy Spirit. Anybody got a car that you just filled it up one time, bought it, filled it up, and still going on that tank of gas? No, you pull back into a gas station. And, and the way this is written here, the way that Paul reads this here, and the way he, writ, he wrote it, it was in, in present tense. It was saying, it, it like, continually being filled with the Spirit. He was writing it to believers, and when we're believers, we get baptized with the Spirit. He's living inside of us, but we get to determine what we allow into our life and how much control we give to Him. Okay? And so he's saying, you know, this is like, uh, 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 my dad's coming up a lot here. Um, but when I was in high school, he'd say, rake the leaves. In my mind, that meant go out and rake the leaves once and be done. You know, leaves keep falling. What he meant was rake the leaves all fall for the rest of your life, basically. <laughs> right? Be raking the leaves forever. Paul is saying, be Filled with the Spirit continually, presently, morning, night, day. So, so how, do we, how do we do that? There's some implications here as we close. It's a passive voice. It doesn't say get out your debit card and go to the pump and pay for more Spirit. It says... Be filled. What he's saying, you make yourself available. You lay yourself down. And he's going to, God does the filling. He's going to fill every open void of your life that you give him access to. So it takes being empty. Empty in ourself. So if you're filled with anger, anger is going to control you. If you're filled with bitterness, it's going to control you. If you're filled with greed, it's going to control you. If you're filled with lust, it's going to control you. Empty yourself. Out, fear, doubt, anger, pride, depression, greed, just lay it all down, empty yourself out of that, open your heart. And he says it's this simple be filled. It's not a one time thing, it's a lifestyle, it's a way we live, fully repentant, realizing I'm not myself, I'm not my own master. I'm not in control of all this. I cannot defeat this temptation by myself. Can you do it better with community? And does it take some, some, some will? Yes, it does. But that alone is not enough. And does the temptation ever go away? No, it never goes away until we get to heaven on the other side. But see, Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send a helper. And he is the Holy Spirit. As the worship team comes up, I ask you this question. Are you living filled to the brink of, with the Holy Spirit? Are you in contact with his power? Is he controlling your life? Or have you let the culture and the world and the things of your, your flesh nature be Begin to control your choices, your friends, the places you go, your thoughts that you have, the things you do in, in private. Is, is, are those things controlling you, or is the Holy Spirit in complete control? Are you in contact with His power, or is something else controlling your life? If you say, well, how, how, do, I, how do I dig out of this? In James 4, 7, he said it like this, so humble yourselves before God resist the devil and he will flee from you then in verse 8 one of my favorite verses 
It says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. That means even as a believer, you are not as close to God as you could be. He's inviting you to come closer to Him, to seek Him out, to empty yourself out, to open your heart to Him and let Him fill you and transform you from the inside out. He says, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. I don't care how far you've gone, what you've done. What, it does not matter. God's grace is bigger than all of that. It should break our hearts that Jesus had to go to the cross. It should overflow our hearts to know that he went. If you've never given your life to Christ, there's no better morning. If you're saved and you've been baptized and the, the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, are you filled? Are you hungry? For him to control your life. God, as we sing one more song here and we respond to your truth and your scripture. So thankful that Jesus withstood this temptation in the wilderness. I'm so thankful that it gives us hope that he had the same resource that we have in Pikeville today, the Holy Spirit. That if we draw upon, we have the power to overcome, to bring godliness and light into darkness. That you have the power to transform even the, the, the most disgusting and corrupt of lives can be shiny with your help. God, we lay it all down to you. We surrender to you. You do whatever you want to. In Jesus' name, amen.